You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production. To some extent, it's a tale as old as time, or at least as old as video games. I absolutely believe Justin's video game addiction is killing him. He won't even eat. That clip was from Dr. Phil almost a decade ago. But I could find you one from 25 days ago or 25 years ago. Gaming addiction has been used as a specter to turn worried parents against the medium, of course. But it also exists, and it's been studied and examined by behavioral scientists. This is not a figment of anyone's imagination. It's something that happens to a small number of people, as it does with many behaviors. Here, though, is what makes it different. As quickly as we study gaming addiction, the games themselves change. The technology and design of video games has been evolving rapidly and continuously since the 1980s. And usually that's done with the express goal of giving players more of what they want, encouraging them to keep going, to come back for seconds or thirds, or just stay up a little later. If you've ever played video games, you know that feeling. And recently, as gaming has moved from a solitary pastime to a connected one, a social aspect has emerged in this as well. Combine all that, and you get stories of parents losing their children to games like Fortnite. So what exactly is gaming addiction? The actual habit itself, not the specter. How have games evolved to become so much more compelling? How far have we come and what have designers learned about what makes us stay on the controller? And if gaming addiction is real, how do we recognize and treat it? I'm Jordan Heath Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Luke Rinaldi is a Toronto-based journalist who dove deep into the issue of modern video game addiction for Maclean's. Hello, Luke. Hi, Jordan. Before we start, I want to put this out there that both you and I are gamers, and the intention of, I believe, your piece and also this conversation is not to bring back the old 1980s, 90s tropes of video games are evil, but what did you want to look at? Well, I wanted to look at how games have changed and how our relationships with games have changed when I started looking into modern gaming and modern gaming addiction, it felt quite a bit different from how I gamed when I was younger. And so I wanted to figure out what has changed and and why is it that kids are, you know, quote unquote, addicted to these games. Okay, so for those who don't game now or who uh, whose past is probably in the 90s or 2000s or whatever, for somebody who's never seen it, how would you describe the game Fortnite? Fortnite, the best way to understand it is probably by comparing it to the Hunger Games. If you've read or watched the Hunger Games, you have an idea of this like battle royale where you have you know, any given number in Fortnite, it's a hundred different players and you drop onto an island and you basically have to kill each other and the last person standing wins. There are some other game modes to Fortnite, but this battle royale mode is its kind of most popular mode. And the game is really, despite its violent objective, very bright and cartoonish and fun and silly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, playing it is really attractive to kids. And maybe explain the social aspect of this kind of game as well, because, you know, when I was gaming as a teenager, I was uh, in my room, maybe with a couple of friends over or whatever, occasionally, but mostly just me and a controller and a screen. Right. Yeah. Fortnite is a completely different experience. You can, of course, play it alone, but you are essentially always playing against real people elsewhere in the world. And oftentimes um, when players are playing, they'll be hooked up to the internet chatting with their friends who are in the same game, either on their team trying to, you know, kill the other teams or um, playing against them. And so it's this added element of community and social experience that you didn't really get from, you know, Pac-Man or 007 on the N64. This is 
a whole new way of interacting with your friends. And with that in mind, maybe just walk us through the child and the family that you opened your story with. Not that this is a one-size-fits-all example, but tell us about Cody and his family in Fortnite and what happened. Right. I think Cody's story is typical in some ways, but extreme in others. I think the typical aspect is that, you know, as a young a young kid, I think he was around the age of nine or so, and he's hearing about Fortnite. It had sort of just come out. This was 2017 or so. He wanted to play and he told his mom, I want to play. And she said, you know, I, I don't know. This seems a bit too violent. You're too young. But he kept at it and he said, please, please, please. And eventually for his birthday, he got an Xbox and started playing Fortnite and he could download it for free. And for a while, it, it, it went fine. You know, he was playing, he was playing with his friends. His mom didn't mind it so much. Um, she could set rules around how often he played and how long. And that, that went okay. During COVID, like for many gamers, I think gaming was something that you could do that, you know, didn't put anyone at risk. And so people spent more time gaming. Mm -hmm. And that was certainly true of Cody. The point at which it really became a problem was when in-person classes opened back up and he returned to school and he started asking his friends, what games are you playing? What's your username? You want to play together tonight? And so he would come home and he'd say, you know, mom, I made some friends. I want to play Fortnite with them. And she said, well, it's not a game night. He started screaming and, and crying and begging to play. And, you know, his mom was pretty firm. But this kind of war went on for months where she would try to maintain some kind of healthy balance between gaming and outdoor activities and classes and family time. And Cody just said, I just want a game. Just let me game. And tell me about the response. You describe it as like screaming and crying. In the piece, there are some examples of pretty extreme behavior. Yeah. So um, essentially, Cody's mom tried all these different ways to prevent Cody from gaming. You know, hid the power cords to the consoles. He found those. Took away his Xbox. He played it on a different device, like a phone. She restricted his Wi-Fi access, but he logged on to her phone, basically hacked in and, <laughs> and restored his, uh, his internet access. And I think the, the one point that really felt like uh, the, the rock bottom was when Cody's mom just said, I'm so tired of this. I'm at my wit's end. You just go outside, play with your brother. And, and she pushes them out, locks the door behind them. And Cody smashes a, a glass panel in the door mm. uh, because he wants to get back in and game. And that, you know, that cost them $2,000 to replace. So this suddenly became not just sort of an emotional and psychological toll, but also a financial cost. And how unique really is his story? You mentioned on the one hand, it is extreme. On the other hand, maybe not. Yeah, I think it's important to note that for the vast majority of people playing video games is not going to develop into a behavior like this. Right. You can play video games to a very healthy degree and there's all kinds of research about how video games can be constructive in all kinds of ways like hand-eye coordination and teamwork. And so Cody's story is certainly extreme because he, you know, th this was an addiction. Like I'm very comfortable classifying this as an addiction. But uh, certainly other people, they'll play Fortnite for an hour or two and then they'll go do something else, hang out with their friends or go outside. Kids will go, you know, play with something else. So this, this should be understood as a bit of an exception to the rule. But I think it's, it's also true that these are becoming more and more common experiences, even if they're still the exception. And I do want to be clear about this before we get into it further around Fortnite and modern games specifically. Like, uh, the specter of video game addiction is not new, as I mentioned. So what kind of research do we have about it? This is something that has been studied uh, for decades now, right? Yeah, absolutely. When I was researching this piece, I found myself reading research from the 90s when people were looking at how games affect our brain. and to sort of understand gaming as an addictive behavior, it's helpful to understand what they do to our, our dopamine levels in our brain. Dopamine is this um, neuromodulator that is sort of associated with our mood 
and excitement and how good we feel. And we get bursts of dopamine when we do something that's exciting or stimulating. And games like Fortnite and games like anything that was out in the 90s, they they will give you a bit of a burst of dopamine when you say beat a level or kill an enemy or do something that feels like an achievement. And when we get these bursts of dopamine, our brain tells us, hey, I want more of that. Can I have some more of that? And you sort of fall into this cycle of of chasing those those dopamine hits. And like any other thing that gives you dopamine, you know, for example, drinking coffee or doing hard drugs, you know, anywhere on that spectrum, you build a, a tolerance. And so gaming sort of becomes this very addiction-like behavior where you're you're sort of chasing something that becomes less and less frequently delivered to you because your your brain simply is not responding in the way that it used to. If this is something that's been studied since the 90s, what's different now uh, than it was back then? And I guess how hard is it to study the impact of something on us that is kind of constantly a moving target, right? Like video games evolve less than a day de- takes less than a decade for a whole new uh system genre console advances in technology and connectivity and all that to to happen. Yeah, you have it exactly right. Video games are evolving at a an extremely rapid pace. And I think that's what's changed is that when some of this research started, games were pretty primitive. They were sort of I don't know. <laughs> uh goofy looking, the graphics were sort of bad. I remember these days and I thought the graphics were amazing, but if you compare them to what we have today, it's it's sort of laughable. Mm-hmm. And so that's one part that's developed. But the other part that's developed is games are everywhere now. It's It's not just like, oh, you go out and buy a video game console. You can play games on your phone. You can play games on your computer. It's truly accessible. And a lot of them are free now. And we can probably get into this later, but... You don't spend any money to play the game like Fortnite, but you do have an opportunity to spend money in the game. And so I think it's all of those factors sort of coming together that makes it makes it easier for for people, especially kids, to play games and easier for them to get sucked in because these games are more advanced. They offer more. And one thing that came up again and again is that games, a lot of modern games, don't don't have an end point. Games used to be like, oh, you you play for a certain amount of time, you beat the final boss, and then that's it. Like, you don't really have any more fun by playing it over and over again. And now, with a game like Fortnite, where you can play another Battle Royale as soon as you finish your last one, and there's no end to, you know, the weapons you can unlock and the costumes you, you can get for your character, there's no natural point at which a kid will say, okay, I'm done, I'm bored. Right. Let's talk about that and talk about Fortnite specifically, since we're about to get into some legal stuff surrounding it. For those who don't play, first of all, give us a sense of how many people play this game. And also, you just touched on it a little bit, but the way the game is designed to not let you go. Yeah. The estimate, and I think Epic Games actually provided this, so we can can count it as quite reliable, is that 500 million users are on Fortnite. Wow. I mean, we can we can say, well, maybe there's people with multiple accounts or, or whatever, but I, I think however you interpret that number, the, the bottom line is that it's huge. Like, there's a huge number of people who are playing and have played Fortnite all over the world. When you're in the game, there are constant updates. There are constantly new things coming. They have a format called Seasons where, you know, for 10 weeks, the the map, the island that you're playing on will look a certain way and there will be a certain sort of underlying plot as to what's going on in the world. And then 10 weeks pass and then there's a new season. Suddenly there's new areas to explore, there's new guns to use, there's new costumes to wear. And so if you are the kind of person who is enjoying yourself in this game, there is endless opportunity to keep playing because, you know, you enjoy the lore. You enjoy the the experience of being in this world, especially if your friends are invested in it. You can talk about it with them and sort of build up the hype. And so there's no point at which you might say to yourself, there, there's, there's nothing left for me to explore here. 
Let's talk about the liability now, um, because this is, again, not something super novel, but I think in a different way than we've seen before. And maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. Can you explain what a group of Canadian parents is doing right now? So there are four families in Canada, three of them in Quebec and one of them in British Columbia, and they've launched the separate class action lawsuits against Epic Games, the video game developer that creates Fortnite. And the reason they've done that is because they found themselves in a situation kind of like Cody's family, where the parents are sort of at their wits end. They have tried everything to get their kids to stop playing, but essentially they've developed addictions and the parents are saying, hey, like we tried our hardest here and Basically, what's happened is my kid is addicted to the product that you brought to market, and it's really messing up their life. And you should have some responsibility for fixing that, um, whether it's through changing the game in some way or, you know, through some kind of payout. And I think it's important to note that not every family that, you know, has a kid who's playing Fortnite is going to qualify for these class action lawsuits. I think it's extremely important to, to underline the fact that in some cases, if a kid is playing too much Fortnite, it is the parent's fault. You know, they, they may not be setting the kinds of healthy boundaries that any family needs. I was going to ask about this because I know everybody listening right now, maybe not everybody, but a, a great deal of people listening right now are like, aren't you just suing the company to cover for your bad parenting? Yeah. And, and I think that's a fair argument. I think it really comes down to the individual families. I assume that when this class action lawsuit goes forward, you're not going to have families who are simply, you know, parents who just went off and did their own thing while, while they let their Xbox babysit their kids. That's not really what we're talking about here. In those cases, I think it's extremely accurate to say the parents messed up. And even I know from the parents that I spoke to, they felt like they messed up to a certain extent. But they also feel like the video game developer does have some amount of responsibility and some amount of liability to recompense the the people who have suffered because of a, a game that these parents claim was intentionally designed to be addictive. Where do these suits stand right now? Lots of lawsuits get filed. What kind of analysis has gone into them? What kind of chance do they have? Where are they? Yeah, so there's two different answers to that question. The BC suit is very new. And so it's it's quite early in the stages and it'll have to go through years of, of uh, work before even a judge says, okay, we're going to allow this class action to go forward. The case that's in Quebec, however, is, is a lot um, further along. It's been certified by a judge, which means that the representative plaintiffs, these three families who, who brought forward the, the case, they've demonstrated that essentially they have a case and a judge agrees. And so at this point, their lawyer, who's working with a firm called Calex in Montreal, he is searching for more families that fit this bill. And he told me that he's heard from 500 or so families who are interested in participating. And I don't think all of those families are going to fit the bill. Some of them will be the sort of cases that we're talking about where, you know, the parents really should have been doing a better job. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly some of them will be families who, you know, they have a, they have a real claim um, where they tried everything and their kids were still addicted and they wasted a lot of money in the game and they want their money back. So it, it may still be years before we have a resolution to this class action lawsuit. And often class actions end in a settlement rather than sort of a, a judgment from a, a judge. Um, so we may not even know the details at a certain point, but we're, I would say right in right in the middle of it. And it, it's interesting to me how these will develop because I'm not sure that I know necessarily who's going to win. What, if anything, has Epic said about the suits and what kind of precedent could this set in the gaming industry? Yeah, Epic has said, has tried to get the, the suits dismissed. The Epic argument is that essentially they created a fun game. They created a game that kids love to play. And that's 100% true. Yeah, of course they did. I mean, the, <laughs> the numbers back that up. This is, this is the most played game of all time. Right. And so should they be punished for essentially making the best, well, I wouldn't say best video game ever, but the most popular video game ever. They say it's a social experience that you can play with friends. And so it's not that sort of dusty basement dwelling 
guy in his you know mom's home uh, who's late wasting his life away but the the judge sort of you know well hearing them out said at the same time the the facts speak, speak for themselves and these these families have really suffered and so we're going to give them a chance to to make their case that that you epic games are indeed liable and if these parents win even if they settle i think it sets a pretty monumental precedent because there are all kinds of suits where someone is held a company liable. For example, if you're in a car crash and the the airbag doesn't deploy and you get hurt, you can hold that company that made that airbag liable for whatever injuries you sustain. But this is this is a bit different because the the injury is an addiction to video games and until very recently that was not even really recognized as a real thing. So this is this is a pretty new territory that we're wading into here and if these parents can say hey my kids lost out on a part of their childhood because they were playing Fortnite it does sort of in theory open us up to a world in which players or their parents or or even users of like smartphone apps like TikTok could say hey i i really wasted a ton of my time on your platform because you filled it with these features that kept me coming back and because of that i'm you know suffering academically i didn't get into the college i wanted to you can sort of take it in any which direction and i and i think there will be naturally some pushback on these arguments but it's certainly not going to stop people from from trying and seeing how far they can take this what eventually happened to cody and his parents, and maybe just before we finish, while you were researching the story, what kind of options did you find for parents listening right now who are recognizing some of these symptoms, or even just people who are, are recognizing just how much time they spend on games like this? Yeah, so so Cody is in a better place now. The, that's the, the good news at the end of the story, is that actually Cody's not playing Fortnite anymore. I, I, it wasn't because he suddenly realized, oh my God, this is this is really uh, ruining my life. It was basically that his friends started playing other games. And so he migrated to those games. Right. But part of his story and how he ended up sort of in a healthier place with video games, even though they are still of a struggle for him and his family, is that they sought professional help. In Canada, there are there are a decent amount of resources, not a huge amount of resources, because this is still a relatively new problem. But if you know where to look, you can find help. The organization that I came across and that I think a lot of people come across when they even do a cursory Google search uh, about gaming addiction is something called Game Quitters. And this was an organization started by uh, a former gaming addict himself. His name's Cameron Adair. And I spoke to him at length for this piece, and he was very helpful in helping me understand what people go through and the, and the cost that video games and uh, video game addiction can have for people and their families. So now Cameron offers uh, counseling, and he is not himself, you know, a trained psychologist or anything like this, but he has partnered with people who are. There's a family coach that he works with, and I think two counselors out in BC who are really specialized in this. There are uh, residential treatment programs where you can sort of do a digital detox if it if it really gets to that stage where you you need to simply go cold turkey. So there are there are ways, and they're they're relatively effective. I think the best way to understand it is you know this is an addiction, and recovery is not a straight line. And for some people, you're going to have to practice abstinence. You're, you're not going to be playing video games anymore. For other people, you can redevelop your relationship with video games and, and make it healthier and set some boundaries, play a little bit, but make sure you have a balance with the other things in your life. Luke, thank you so much for this. Um, fascinating story. And uh, maybe this time after three decades, we'll get it right. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for having me, Jordan. Luke Rinaldi writing in McLean's magazine. That was The Big Story. If you want more, head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. If you are already super mad at us for talking about gaming addiction and making video games seem evil and all of those things that right-wingers have been doing to video games since the 1980s, you can give us some feedback. I don't mind. I'm a gamer myself. So is Luke, as we both mentioned. And we'd love to hear from other gamers on this topic. 
You can find us on Twitter at TheBigStoryFPN. You can email us. The address is hello at TheBigStoryPodcast.ca. And of course, you can call us 416-935-5935 and leave a voicemail. Also, if you're already doing that stuff, I'd love to know what you're playing these days because I need a new obsession. You can find The Big Story in absolutely any podcast player, and you can always ask your smart speaker for it by saying, play The Big Story podcast. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow. Tomorrow.